Los Angeles Times, October 23, 1980. It said, Seventh-day Adventist controversy, plagiarism found in prophets' books. Now, folks, that was on the front page of the L.A. Times back in 1980. And within a couple of days, the Washington Post picked up the same headline, picked up the same article. And within a few weeks, from the L.A. Times to the Washington Post, that article, friends, spread through newspapers and magazines throughout the world. And the attack was made, plagiarism found in prophets' books. Wow. Now, plagiarism... Plagiarism is taking information from somebody else's materials, from somebody else's books, and using that material to elevate yourself, to make your books and your work more important than somebody else. A very strong attack was made against Ellen White. Ellen White was called a plagiarist. Now, the L.A. Times writer who wrote that article, his name was John Dart. And where John Dart got his information was from a study that had been done by this man, Ron Numbers a book that he had written in 1976 called Prophetess of Health. Now in that book, Prophetess of Health, Ronald Numbers had said that Ellen White's health messages in her books, Councils on Diet and Foods, Ministry of Healing, Councils on Health, that all those had been were simply materials that Ellen White had borrowed from other contemporary health reformers. And that nothing in her books had required a supernatural explanation. So Ronald Numbers went right to the very jugular vein of Ellen White and said, Ellen White simply took information from health reformers in her day and nothing in her books had anything to do with God directing her. Friends, it was a very strong attack. First by Ronald Numbers in 1976 and then by John Dart in the LA Times in 1980. Ronald Numbers had said in reviewing Ellen White's health reform principles, readers should first place themselves in the middle of the 19th century without any more information about the future than the prevailing notions that govern medical practice at that time. Think of how strange the unfolding, synthesizing, integrating health principles of Ellen White must have seemed. Some of these principles had been promoted by contemporaries, but in no place were they so complete or so integrated. No other writers were so free from those errors that subsequent research contradicted. For the average person, even for doctors in the middle of the 19th century, the germ theory was unheard of. Physicians were still using opium calomel, mercury, arsenic, strychnine to heal disease. Aspirin was unknown along with the x-ray machine, antibiotics, pasteurization, immunizations, and blood transfusions. People generally saw no connection between their lifestyle and disease. Fresh air in the home, night or day, aroused qualms for fear of catching a cold or being bitten by an invasion of flies or mosquitoes, and people seldom took a bath. 
Folk, Ronald Numbers assaulted Ellen White's writings and said there's nothing in her writings on health that was anything but what was already available in the 19th century. And there is the cover of Ron Numbers' book, Prophetess of Health, a study of Ellen White. Well, it's very fascinating that, yes, many of what things that Ellen White said in regards to health were also in existence in her time. People were advocating a vegetarian diet. People were advocating the use of hydrotherapy. People were advocating the use of outdoor exercise. So all of those things were prevalent in Ellen White's time. But does that mean that that's all she wrote about and that she simply borrowed it from other people? Well, there were many other things that Ellen White talked about other than a vegetarian diet, uh, the use of hydrotherapy and... Uh, outdoor exercise. There were many, many other things that she discussed in her writings. Headlines shouting the deteriorating impact of high-fat, low-fiber diets and the sheer necessity of exercise were a century away. So people in Ellen White's day we're not talking. They said, yeah, vegetarian diet is good, but they didn't talk about having low fiber diets. Ellen White stressed exercise in the open air. The profound linkage between the mind and body seemed far fetched. But Ellen White saw that in her writings and in what she saw in vision. Birth defects due to drugs and alcohol were not to be understood for another hundred years. Ellen White talked about un unknown to any other health person in the 19th century. Ellen White said that the prenatal effects of what mom is doing and what she's taking into her system has a direct effect on the child. Ellen White was far ahead of her time. The concept of cancer germs was a thought that was cross-grained with the medical world. In the 19th century, Ellen White said that cancer was related to flesh eating and to smoking. Ellen White saw things, folk, that were a hundred years before her time. That she got from no health professional in her day. Prenatal influences were considered of little importance. In many of these areas, as recently as a few decades ago, Ellen White seemed not only extreme, but even fanatical. Imagine how she could have been viewed in 1863. The record is in those who believed in her role as God's messenger. Those who faithfully put her health principles into practice became healthier, stronger, more productive people. So while Ronald Numbers sought to say, well, Ellen White simply borrowed from health reformers in the 19th century. The truth of the matter was, she did borrow some of the concepts at that time, but friend, there were other things where she was a hundred years ahead of her time. Ellen White said that bread should be thoroughly baked so that as far as possible the yeast germ shall be destroyed. She was scoffed at for this statement. 
even as late as the 1940s. Where did she get that idea, friends? It wasn't prevalent with the health reformers, with Sylvester Graham, who of course invented the Graham cracker. It was not known by Thrall, another health person in the 19th century. Where did she get it? How did she know? We now know that live yeast cells take up B vitamins from the food material in the intestine, thus making them unavailable for the body. How about butter? In 1870, Ellen White wrote that from principle she had discarded the use of meat, butter, mince pies, spices, and lard. She stated in 1903, I have settled the butter question. I do not use it. Health principles for Ellen White guided one's plan of life in determining what the best choice should be under all circumstances. At times, in the absence of the best, we must settle for the good. Here again, we see her principle of progressive diet reform. Isn't that interesting? At times, in the absence of the best, we settle for the good. Ellen White even told foreign missionaries that had very little fruits, nuts, grains, and vegetables. She even counseled them <laughs> to eat flesh food. It wasn't the best but it was what was there at that time. Butter is less harmful when eaten on cold bread than when used in cooking. When properly prepared, olives like nuts supply the place of butter and flesh meats. What's bad about butter? Two basic problems, disease and health factors relating to fat and cholesterol. Next slide, sweetie. Meat and cancer germs. When Ellen White wrote that tuberculosis, cancer, and other fatal diseases are caused by tuberculosis and cancerous germs, the medical world scoffed and continued to do so for many decades, but not today. In 1974, milk from leukemic cows was fed to six chimpanzees. Two died with leukemia demonstrating that cancer viruses can be transmitted. The chicken leukosis virus can be found in 5 to 10% of all eggs. Meat and diabetes in the Adventist Health Study. Those who consume meat six or more days a week had a 3.8 times greater risk than vegetarians of dying of diabetes. So Ellen White understood the far-reaching effects of a steady meat diet. And she said it contains cancerous germs. And people scoffed at her and laughed at her. Where did she get that information? She didn't get it from Sylvester Graham or other reformers in the 19th century. Next slide, sweetie. While it's true that Ellen White adopted several of the health reform ideas of others in the 19th century, she had the keen insight to discard the negative or wrong things that these health reformers espoused. She advocated a vegetarian diet, the use of hydrotherapy and healing, which were prevalent during the 19th century but she always avoided the extremes of such doctors, Sylvester Graham and Thrall, among others. How did she know what to embrace of what these men said and what to reject? How did she advocate things they knew nothing about that were only discovered in the late 20th century. Did she copy those two? 
Did she borrow those two from somebody? No. God showed her. God showed her. The other man that was mentioned in John Dart's article in the Los Angeles Times was a man named Walter Ray. Walter Ray. The LA Times religion news reporter John Dart had been researching Spectrum Magazine, the Adventist Review, the Ministry Magazine, and other statements from the Ellen G. White estate discussing the crisis created by Ron Numbers in his book, Prophetess of Health. Many readers had become unsettled by the evidence that Ellen White's health messages had been shaped or borrowed from contemporary health reformers and did not require a supernatural explanation. When it came time to interview sources, Dart already knew much about White's liberal borrowing and the lively debate over the nature of her inspiration that had emerged during the past few years. Dart began his article by stating that he believed the main reason for her prodigious output could be explained by plagiarism. In a church body where most people believe that White's words came to her directly from God, he continued thinking that the spirit of prophecy was a word thief stuck at the very heart of Adventism. Folk, let's analyze Mr. Dart's comments for a moment. He said that most Seventh-day Adventists believed that when Ellen White wrote something down, it was something that God directly dictated to her. Is that what we believe? Was Ellen White verbally inspired so that every word she wrote came right from God? Of course not. Of course not. That's called verbal inspiration. And as Seventh-day Adventists, for well-knowing Seventh-day Adventists, Ellen White and those who knew her best never taught that she was verbally inspired. How does inspiration work? Clearly, Mr. Dart didn't understand. Many Seventh-day Adventists don't understand it. And most surely, Walter Ray didn't understand it. Folk, when Ellen White was given a vision, and we'll focus, say, on health, God showed Ellen White in sweeping vision health principles about how somebody could live a healthy life by practicing the eight laws of health. And after receiving that sweeping vision on health, the Lord then said to her, Ellen, you go back now and write out what you saw. And so Ellen White would then go back and she would write out the things that she had seen. Now friends, Ellen White was an avid reader on health, on prophecy, on history, on scripture. And in her reading, her broad reading, she had a huge library if she came across something that somebody said in one, of her, in one of those books that she was reading that clearly stated what she had seen in vision, was it not her right to simply borrow that material to then state it in her books? to clearly set forth the truth of God. You know, Matthew chapter 21, 
As Jesus was going into Jerusalem for his final entry in Matthew chapter 21, the Bible says that Jesus sent two of his disciples. In verse 2, it said, Go into the village over against you, and straightway you shall find an ass tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And if any man say aught to you, you shall say, The Lord hath need of them. And straightway he will send them. Folk, as Ellen White was communicating the truth of God with a limited education, was it not her right to borrow solid material that said exactly what she had seen in vision? And why not? The Lord had need of it in communicating truth. John Dart then makes comments that are very untrue. He said, Ellen White denied any literary dependency. Ellen White never denied that. In fact, in the introduction to the great controversy, which we will read shortly, she made it very clear that if some other author had written something that was good and true, that she would borrow it and use it in her own writing. So this is a very extreme picture that Mr. Dart painted in the Los Angeles Times. Dart wrote, she was dependent on the spirit of the Lord in receiving and writing her views. Now that is true. In fact, it says, paraphrasing White herself, Dart wrote, she was dependent on the Spirit of the Lord in receiving and writing her views. Absolutely she was. And what is so amazing about the spirit of prophecy is that in all the reading that Ellen White did, how did she know what to use and what not to use? How did she know what was right and what was wrong? Because the Spirit of God directed her. He also quoted from one of her letters, the words I employ in describing what I have seen are my own, unless they be spoken to me by an angel, which I always enclose in marks of quotation. Now, Mr. Dart is trying to make Ellen White out here to be a liar. Because Ellen White said, the words I used were my own. Well, folk, if I quote something that somebody else has said, those become mine. They're mine now. So Ellen White very clearly could say, the words are my own because I am using them for my own work. Next slide, sweetie. Walter Ray, the man who John Dark quoted, a Seventh-day Adventist pastor, shortly in the 1980s after Dart's article, came out with a book called The White Lie. The Adventist church was jolted in the media by wrenching skepticism and doubt about the truthfulness of its prophetess. Only this time, the defense of Ellen White's legacy, glued to the pedestal of church authority, would have to rely on refutations and defenses provided by stewards of the Lord. Syndicated in the Associated Press, John Dart's article traveled worldwide, swept into other media, 
Some estimated that the plagiarism story was published in hundreds of newspapers and magazines. So Walter Ray came out with his white lie. He said, Ellen White borrowed material. What's wrong with borrowing material? What's wrong with that? Next slide, sweetie. Little background on Walter Ray. He was born in 1922 in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Graduated from PUC in 1944. Hired as a pastor in 1945. Started an Adventist church in Lompoc, California. Moved to Florida. He was pastor of the Crest Memorial Church in Orlando, as well as in Fort Myers and Jacksonville, before he returned to Southern Cal, where he led congregations in Pomona, Alhambra, and Long Beach. Now this is Walter Ray writing in his book, The White Lie. He said, from the first time I heard of Ellen White, early in my teens, I became a devotee of hers. I learned to type by copying from her book, Messages to Young People. In high school and college, I often went from room to room in the dormitory, gathering Ellen White quotations from others to use in my preparations for becoming a minister. It was during those days I conceived the idea of preparing an Adventist commentary by compiling from the writings of Ellen White all the statements pertaining to each book of the Bible and each Bible character. I compiled two volumes of Old and New Testament Bible biographies, incorporating with each entry the pertinent quotations found in Ellen White's works and a third volume on Daniel and Revelation. Soon these books were sold in most Adventist book and Bible houses and used in many Adventist schools and colleges. Folk, I have these two books of Walter Ray's in my library. They're very good. Very good. For many years, Ray promoted the writings of Ellen White. All of these were distributed through the denomination's bookstores. He became aware that Ellen White used information and language from books by Alfred Eidersheim in a number of her books. He began to compare her writings with contemporary sources known to be in her personal library found many places where she appears to borrow material. As a result, a number of research projects were commissioned by the denomination's general conference. Friend, in borrowing material from other sources, Ellen White had every right to that material. The big question is, was her intent to supersede the other person's work? Was her intent to make them be pushed down so that she would be exalted? Was that her intent? Now, Walter Ray, in his book, The White Lie, pages 19 to 22, he says, while working on my projected volume four, I happened across something interesting at Orlando, Florida, where I was pastor of the Crest Memorial Church. The Crest family gave me an old book by Ellen White called Sketches from the Life of Paul, published in 1883, but never reprinted. 
When I showed the book to a church member, I was told that the problem of that book was that it was too much like another book that had not been written by Ellen White and that it had never been reprinted because of the close similarities. I did a comparison study and discovered that some of the criticism seemed to be true. After I transferred to California, the McGann family were members of my congregation. At the death of Wellesley's father's widow, Lillian McGann, I was given a book from the McGann family library, Elisha the Prophet by Alfred Eidersheim. On the flyleaf was Ellen White's signature. By now, because of my constant use of Ellen White's books, I had become so familiar with them that I readily recognized similarities of wording and thought as I examined Eidersheim's book. I was shocked to come across a seven-volume work on Old Testament history by Eidersheim. This time I found in volumes one to four that Eidersheim's chapter titles, subtitles, and page headings paralleled and were many times almost identical with the chapter titles of Ellen White's Patriarchs and Prophets. Time and study made it obvious that Mrs. White had obtained liberal help from these additional Eidersheim works. Further investigation would reveal that Eidersheim had written also a New Testament history on the life of Christ. And in this too, there were additional similarities with Mrs. White's desire of ages. Now again, folk, as Walter Ray is writing this in his book, The White Lie, the impression is that somehow there's something very sinister and very crooked about what Ellen White did. Which leaves me shocked because as Ellen White is given a sweeping vision covering thousands of years and the Lord says now go back and write what you have seen being the prolific reader that she was if she came across material that somebody had written on a Bible subject or a theological subject, why couldn't she use that in her writing? Wouldn't you? I know I would. I know I would. Go ahead, sweetie. Walter Ray continues on, pages 22 and 23 of his book. He says, she used some from the great teacher by John Harris, which they've admitted. And my response would be, big deal. Why not? She used the life of Christ by William Hanna, which they've admitted. She used the life of Christ by Ferrar, which they've admitted. My book will give a further list of those she used. The Acts of the Apostles. She used the life and epistles of the Apostle Paul by Coney Barenhausen. And the great controversy I've read to you from Willie White that in the new edition the reader will find more than 400 references to 88 authors and authorities. Now friend, Walter Ray, in his book The White Lie, is seeking to say, because of this, Ellen White is a plagiarist. And my question would be, why would we put plagiarism to this incredible researcher? Why wouldn't we instead say she was a tremendous researcher? 
Why wouldn't we say that? Unless our bent, we are bent towards seeking to destroy the life and ministry of God's messenger. My response is, big deal. She borrowed from others. A woman with a third grade education was shown in vision the dramatic scenes of the great controversy spanning thousands of years. The Lord told her to go write out what she saw. Because she felt insufficient to meet the task, because she was an avid reader and sometimes came across material, she felt would explain what she saw. She chose to use the writer's material. Walter Ray cried foul, as did Dudley Canwright a hundred years before. It was splashed all over the world through the news media. <gasps> She's a plagiarist. She, she's a liar. No, she's not. She was a tremendous researcher that felt her insufficiencies to communicate the incredible scenes that she saw. So she borrowed, in certain cases, material that clearly set forth an idea. Ellen White herself, in the introduction to the great controversy. Next slide, sweetie. She said this, in the introduction to the great controversy. She says, in some cases, where a historian has so grouped together events as to afford in brief a comprehensive view of the subject, or has summarized details in a convenient manner, his words have been quoted. She said it already, friend. This is no shock, this is no secret. Ellen White, in the intro to the great controversy, said, I've done this because I felt they said it more clearly. She said, but in some instances, no specific credit has been given. Since the quotations are not given for the purpose of citing that writer as authority, but because his statement affords a ready and forcible presentation of the subject. Case closed. Case closed. Why? Why were Seventh-day Adventists shocked by Ronald Numbers' book in the 1970s? Why were they backpedaling, backtracking over Walter Ray's book in the 1980s? Why? Helen White already said, sure, I borrowed. Sure. To enhance, to enhance the truth of God to be given to all the world. Well, Ronald Numbers said Ellen White was a plagiarist. And Walter Ray said the same thing. And Ellen White has spoken. And I've thrown in my two cents. But how about in a legal sphere? Was Ellen White guilty of a crime? After Numbers and Ray's assertions of plagiarism, the General Conference hired a Catholic attorney, name was Vincent Ramick, to investigate Ellen White and the charges of plagiarism to see if she had done wrong in her work. 
Let's see what Vincent Ramick, the attorney, found. Ellen White used the writings of other, Ramick said, but in the way she used them, she made them uniquely her own, ethically as well as legally. She invariably improved that which she selected. The reviewer said, do you have anything you would like to add on this fascinating subject? Ramick said, yes, I believe it was Warren Johns who shared this analogy with me. The situation is something like the builder who wishes to build a house. There are certain basic essential units of building materials that are available to him. Windows, doors, bricks, and so on. There are even certain recognizable kinds of textures and styles that have been created by various combinations of these different materials. The builder brings together many of these and uses them. The design of the house the ultimate appearance, the ultimate shape, the size, the feel are all unique to the immediate contemporary builder. He individually puts his own stamp on the final product and it is uniquely his. He doesn't say or need to say, I got this brick from this person. I got this door from over here. I got these windows. No, he doesn't have to say that. I think it was that way with Ellen White's use of words, phrases, clauses, sentences, paragraphs, yes, even pages from the writings of those who went before her. She stayed, Vincent Ramick, attorney, Roman Catholic, she stayed well within the legal boundaries of fair use. And all the time created something that was substantially greater and even more beautiful than the mere sum of the component parts. I think the ultimate tragedy is that the critics fail to see this. They don't want to see this. You know, one of the books that Ellen White is accused of using was the book by John Harris on the life of Christ. An excellent book that was in Ellen White's library. And I'd like to close with this statement this morning. John Harris wrote this in the 19th century. He was a contemporary, born 1802, died 1856. He was a contemporary of Ellen White. This is what he said. He says, suppose, for example, an inspired prophet were now to appear in the church to add a supplement to the canonical books, to the Bible books. He said this, what a babel of opinions would he find existing on almost every theological subject and how highly probable it is that his ministry would consist or seem to consist in the mere selection and ratification of such of these opinions at accorded with the mind of God, should be a capital G. Absolute originality would seem to be impossible. The inventive mind of man has already bodied forth speculative opinions in almost every conceivable form forestalling and robbing the future of its fair proportion of novelties and leaving it little more even to a divine messenger 
than the office of taking some of these opinions and impressing them with the seal of heaven. What did Harris say in 1836 in his book, The Great Teacher? He said, if an inspired messenger came along today, what they would pretty much be doing is taking from here, taking from there, taking from there, and putting the seal of heaven's approval on that material. And friend, in the final analysis, in many, many ways, that's exactly, this is exactly what Ellen White did. The defense rests. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you today for the great gift of prophecy. Thank you for the writings of Ellen White that still guide your people today, that are still a blessing in a dark place in this hour of earth's history. We just pray that you would continue to strengthen us to share these great truths that you impressed her to share all over this planet. In Christ's name I pray, amen.